Hello there, my name is Amelia, and here we are with my new video cast that has an unreasonably exciting title. Wait for it, wait for it, the most intriguing military battles. And while some people may find it less than awesome, I think military history is pretty cool. And since you have now been watching me for more than 30 seconds, I assume that you are of the same opinion. Before we get started, let me give you a little background on my stand on military history. So here is a huge secret. Don't tell anybody in a previous life. No, 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 actually two lives ago. I was the great, some may even say the greatest Russian general, Mikhail Kutuzov. On a more serious note, I think that the leaders who devise the military strategies throughout history can be viewed as either supremely gifted or as hopeless losers, who made an already bloody business of war so much worse due to their complete incompetence. The most interesting military campaigns that I have selected for this series are so awesome and so unusual that I'm dying to share them with you. For the record, I am not an anti-war activist, and my goal is not to depict military campaigns in all of their gory details. However, wars have been an essential component of every turning point in history. In no way do I advocate wars as a means of solving anything, but it seems to me that wars are unavoidable. I've always wanted to understand how much wars are driven by the testosterone-rich playground bullies, the politicians or military leaders who are ready to strike when anyone just looks at them funny, what I would call a macho factor, and how much they are driven by a real economic need to kill off a dying system, think the French or the Russian Revolution, or a need to defend one's country, like the Finns fighting the massive Soviet army in 1939. Enough with introductions. Let's get this show on the road. On the road again. For today, I chose one of my favorite battles that became known as the Battle on Ice which was fought on April 5th of 1242 between the Novgorod Republic, Russia, and an unruly mix of German, Scandinavian, and Estonian knights who, inspired by the Novgorod riches, as well as a desire to convert everything that moves into Catholicism, decided to poke the Russian bear. Never a good idea. There are three main reasons that I have chosen this battle. First of all, it's a great example of military creativity using landscape and weather conditions to one's advantage. Second, the results of this less well-known battle are long-lasting and had huge political and sociological impacts. Lastly, it pays tribute to my Russian heritage. Let's start with some really boring, but very important background before sinking our teeth into the good stuff. On one side of this battle, we have a reluctant cooperation between the Livonian Order and the Teutonic Knights. Despite the different names, all of these boys love heavy metal. And I don't mean that heavy metal. I mean this heavy metal. Remember, this is the 13th century we're talking about. By the way, for a while, I had trouble determining which century it was based on the year, until I learned a simple trick of discarding the last two digits on the right and adding one to the number that remained. Let's try it. Here we have the year 1242. If I ignore the digits, four and two on the right side of the year, all I have left is 12. Now I add one and get the 13th century. As Billy Ray Cyrus used to say, Sweet frozen niblets. Okay, now back to the heavy metal boys, also known as the Knights in Shining Armor. There was no shortage of these guys all over Europe at that time. But here on the Baltic Sea, these boys are sitting on the fault line between Western Christianity and the Eastern one. You may have heard of a great schism of 1053, when the Pope of Rome and the Pope of Constantinople agreed to disagree on many fairly stupid and some not so stupid religious doctrines. Each of them boasted nasty things about the other on Instagram and tweeted that from that point on, all Christians had to take sides, and so they did with Western Europe falling into the Roman religious zone, while the Greeks, Russians, Bulgarians, Serbians, and still others fell under the Byzantine influence, deciding to remain under the Constantinople umbrella. This, by the way, is why the Russian military equipment and uniforms look remarkably like they've been stolen, or borrowed, from the Byzantine warriors. In general, the warriors of Western Europe adopted much heavier armor, 
with some of the knights fighting on a part-time basis, while others dedicated their entire lives to serving God, and got a little retirement plan during the occasional crusades, aka pillaging. These knights often became members of various religious orders where they prayed a lot, helped the neighboring widows and orphans, and limited drinking, womanizing, and brawling to Fridays and Saturdays only. These orders were especially numerous in the area where Western Europe met the Eastern one. Thus, Livonia was highly desirable for those who wanted to spread the word of God, the right word of the correct God, to their neighbors, while charging them practically nothing for their services. Wait, 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 you may say. Where the heck is Livonia? Is it like Genovia from Princess Diaries? Genovia. Or Andalasia from Enchanted? Oh, 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 oh. No, it was a real country, which after many changes ended up as the present territory of Latvia, as well as parts of Estonia and Finland. By the way, if you live in Michigan, you're in luck. There is still a Livonia there. I went in search of medieval knights and failed miserably. But I did find that feisty spirit and disrespect for the rule of law that still remain in Livonia. Here's a sign by a local church that I passed by. Ah, stealing air conditioning units from the religious establishment. Now that is what I call true knighthood. Since these knight dudes were way too noble to get their own food, when the villagers gradually disappeared to escape from their unruly neighbors, the knights had to find another means for existence. And with papal blessing, they would embark on another holy mission to bring the light of Western Christianity to the backward Eastern European natives. By the middle of the 13th century, the Livonian Order, Brethren of the Sword, and the Teutonic Knights joined forces, greedily eyeing the independent Novgorod Republic, which eventually became part of the Russian Empire and then the Soviet Union, and is now part of the Russian Federation. At the time, Novgorod was a powerful republic, with the city of Novgorod at its center, and, enticed by its riches, the knights decided to strike. Curiously, the Novgorod Republic was as close to a democracy as one could get with all of the important questions decided by the large gathering of its citizens, the Novgorodsky Vieci. These gatherings could turn rather ugly and resembled a session in an old British parliament, but replaced the fancy dress and the cloaks with the drunken citizens. While Novgorod had its own militia, in times of serious trouble, it could hire an assigned ruler, or knyaz in Russian. During the early 1240s, this leader of choice was a young Alexander, who had already been invited by the city before, defending Novgorod from the greedy Swedes, to whom I am forever grateful for giving the world the gift of Abba. And Swedish fish. The battle with the Swedish knights took place in 1240 on the river Neva, not far from the current location of modern day St. Petersburg. Despite his glorious victory and a new honorific title, Nevsky, Alexander was not terribly popular since he extracted almost one-seventh of the Novgorod annual GDP, gross domestic product, in order to pay off the Mongols, who were circling like vultures over Russia. One by one, all of the major Russian cities, such as Vladimir, Kiev, and Sustal, had fallen to the Mongols. Novgorod remained the only city that was not destroyed. For that, however, the Novgorod Republic had to submit and send them tributes of money and slaves. At the time of this barter, Novgorod could only think of their own pockets and failed to see the historical importance of this move. Few people volunteered as tributes. I volunteer as tribute. Uh, I believe we have a volunteer. And Alexander had to extract them by force. Thus, when the Teutonic Knights took one of their border cities, Skov, Novgorod sent for Alexander, while still being bitter about the entire Mongol affair. Alexander came with his private army, the Rujina, a small but highly effective and well-trained fighting machine in full tactical gear and an unrestrained appetite for alcohol. <laughs> Novgorod subordinated their own militia to Alexander, but sent their military leader, Voyevoda, to watch Alexander's every move. So here was this dude Nevsky's predicament. 
He's smart enough to see that if Novgorod is taken over, the entire Mother Russia goes kaput. He also knows that the Mongols will want more money or they will attack. He needs to make sure that Novgorod is defended, but he needs to ensure that it is done at a minimal cost with the maximum effect. Therefore, the war is inevitable, but it has to be conducted with laser precision and has to be quick and decisive and thus less costly. And that is where the brilliance of Alexander Nevsky as a military strategist really shines. He knows that he does not have the famed Russian T-34 tanks at his disposal, but he doesn't want to just sit still and look pretty, like some of us do, while the Germans literally ride their white horses into Novgorod. Alexander goes on area reconnaissance and finds Lake Chutsko, or Lake Pipus. He also finds a giant rock in the middle of the rather flat landscape. Now, picture this. It's a warm, early April day in northern Russia. The birds are chirping and then dropping dead from hypothermia. The lake is covered with ice and the water that froze while hitting that big raven's rock is broken off into hundreds of sheets of ice of various shapes and forms. The mildly intoxicated locals are enjoying the warm spring day, demonstrating their new Speedos. I wear Speedos when I'm at the beach. You see me Alexander decides to use the rock as a natural barrier that will hide his right flank, mostly his Drugina and the cavalry, as well as the elite Novgorod militia on the left flank. The less well-equipped and trained hastily raised city army will form the main body of the force which is supposed to take on the main thrust of the invading army. The knights are well known to love fighting on a flat, open space, and Alexander was comfortable that they would take his bait. Now, hiding half of your army away from enemy sight was hardly a novel idea at the time, even when they had very limited communication possibilities. You can hide them well, and you can hide them far, but by the time that they come to rescue their comrades in arms, they are old news. The trick is to hide them close by, but hide them well enough that they won't be seen. So here is the coolest thing about this battle. Alexander invited several speedo-wearing swimmers into his tent, asking them all kinds of personal questions, mostly about the lake. And after an entire night in five gallons of vodka, he learned that the southeast side of the lake gets considerably more sunshine during the day, and therefore the ice is much thinner, which is good for fishing while the ice in front of the Raven's Rock always sits in the shade and is much thicker. Thick ice, not good for fishing, but good for the Russian army. Alexander realizes that if his forces can push the enemy to the left, where the ice is thinner, then the ice may not support the many overweight German warriors. Actually, they were all tall, blonde, and handsome, and all wore shiny uniforms. And who, may I ask, does not like guys in shiny uniforms? Unless, of course, they weigh north of 300 pounds. Alexander's right flank was almost twice the size and it was reinforced by professional cavalry fighters who were much more mobile as compared to the heavily armed knights. So what's the plan here? We're Americans! We don't plan, we do! <laughs> the idea was that when the Germans attack and their momentum peters out, they are engaged in a battle with the main Novgorod army. Then, the right flank will attack, appearing almost out of nowhere, and push the army onto the sunny spot of the lake, to the left of the rock. The left flank, lacking cavalry, could not appear as quickly as could the boys from the right side. And yet, the left guys had to remain invisible. What happens next has no definitive confirmation, yet several Russian chronicles reported a miraculous transformation. With the shields of the left flanks, turned into sheets of ice, thus blending in with the surrounding lake and making them invisible to the enemy. Some historians believe that this was no miracle, but a genius military strategy, requiring soldiers to put large chunks of ice over their shields, thus building a crazy ice structure, which looked very much like the ice conglomeration on either side of the Raven's Rock. <laughs> How neat is that? That's pretty neat. Well. Everything worked out per Alexander's genius plan. As he anticipated, the Germans attacked in a pig formation with the snout reinforced by the heavily armored knights. 
followed by the lighter cavalry, which were followed by the infantry and archers. As the avant-garde German, Scandinavian, Livonian army collided with the main Russian force, it split it almost into two pieces. To their credit, the Russians held the German advance, and the opposing army started to pile on, a phenomenon where each subsequent wave of attackers cannot advance forward before their beloved comrades die, thus allowing them to get to the killing business, while the wave that arrived after them is waiting for their turn. This effect broke the advancing momentum of the Teutonic Knights, or crossbearers as they were called by Eastern Europeans. And when they were helplessly entangled into hand-to-hand -hand combat, Alexander rapidly advanced his right flank and began pushing the bulk of the German army towards the sunny spot on the lake. Thus far, we have presented the Russians as savvy military strategists, while portraying the Germans as a bunch of blue-eyed, tall, but legally blonde dudes. Which, of course, is not fair. Not all of them had blue eyes, and they did exhibit a great deal of ingenuity in this battle. As they felt their fortune reversing, they surprised the Russian troops with their perka turtle, also known as the turtle pine strategy. For those of you who are not familiar with this very serious, accurately named military tactic, don't attempt to look it up. I invented the name. Although, I think it describes the strategy rather well. Consider the precision, with which retreating knights form a semicircular mini fortress, using their oversized shields which allows them to repel an attack. This ends up resembling a turtle and a porcupine, hence the name. Once the wave has been broken, the archers can counterattack, driving the enemy farther away and allowing for a regrouping. In the end, Alexander and his army ended up succeeding in pushing the knights onto the sunny side of the lake and all that beer and German hot dogs, not to mention the heavy metal gear, broke the ice. And not in the good, social kind of ice-breaking way. My name is Borat, I come from Kazakhstan. With many of the best, and thus heaviest dudes, taking a refreshing swim in the icy water, the remaining troops hastily retreated, affording a great victory for Novgorod. This battle became even more significant over the years as it became clear that Novgorod ended up being the rallying point of unification for the typically less than friendly Russian city-states, as they rebuilt after the Mongols attack. Alexander appeared to most Russians as the natural leader of this greater Rus, with his famous and totally invented saying, those who come to us bearing the sword shall die by it. He was a picture-perfect national hero. The Mongols saw him in a similar way, and during one of his frequent visits to the Mongols HQ, they gently poisoned him. Over the next 100 years, Moscow began taking over for Novgorod as a rallying point for the broader coalition, culminating in yet another fantastic battle, which put an end to the Mongol occupation. But that is for another time. In the years right before World War II, this battle acquired an even greater symbolic meaning for the Soviet Union, as it faced a prospect of a much more menacing conflict with Germany. In 1938, as a means of propaganda, a movie, Alexander Nevsky, fragments of which I used a lot in this video, appeared in every movie theater across the Soviet Union to boost morale of the population and remind them that a great leader like Nevsky, or Stalin, is never wrong. And so it is super noble to give your life for the motherland, despite the fact that this fairy motherland did little to prepare for the war, except for releasing cheesy propaganda movies. Well, that's about it, folks. Join us next time for an even more exciting episode, which will be a surprise. In the meantime, if you like this video, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. It lets us know that you appreciate the video and encourages us to make more. Thanks.